To The Point with Michael Williams. Good morning. As 2022 begins to draw to a close, we look back and ahead today on water issues. For many years, as you well know, toxic algae issues front and center along the St. Lucie River estuary and Indian River Lagoon with huge environmental and economic impacts. The last few years have seen relief, but much remains to be done as part of water quality and management efforts across our region. My guest, Mark Perry, Executive Director of the Florida Oceanographic Society, and I thank you for being with us. No problem. Familiar face and a voice and an ambassador for water quality here and water issues. Talk about where we are short term, where we've been this year, where we're going, then we'll expand our view and vision. Sure, we, you know, we've been, had some really good years, as you mentioned, uh, right up to now. And it's last been, couple of years. Yeah, the last couple of years have been really good for the balance that we need in the estuaries and the coastal systems. So what happened this year, though, is we went from January through into our wet season. We started out pretty good. Everything was dry, salinities were good. But then in July, we had that normal, typical drop in, in salinities with more freshwater inflows, which we expected in the wet season. But then, of course, September hit. And mm -hmm. September, at the end of September, Ian hit us and uh, dropped 13 plus inches of rain. And then in November, of course, we, we had another, you know, eight plus inches of rainfall from uh, Nicole. And those two systems together just inundated our system uh, completely from Lake Okeechobee, Kissimmee, Lake Okeechobee, all the way south. So what happened is filled up the lake. Now we went from 12 and a half feet in mid-September up to 16 and a half feet mm -hmm. in Lake Okeechobee now. And they're very, very concerned about where are they going to put this water? They need to send it south, but they, they have, may have to end up discharging it east and west to the estuaries, which is where we don't want it. And you affect salinity. Right. You're not worried at this time of year about toxic algae as much, but salinity issues when you need more brackish water for survival of marine life uh, in the estuary right. and lagoon, right. you throw that off balance yet again. Right. At the, at the, you know, in the summer months when the temperatures are high yeah. and you have that nutrient inflow, you, you worry about toxic algae blooms and then the discharge is happening. That's now not the case where we've kind of passed that. We're in cooler temperatures, but the, the still the water is there and it's present. And what happens now is the, we've got to decide how to get the water. As we look on so the whole uh, yeah. river estuary lagoon video that we're playing for mm -hmm. you right now, it speaks to larger issues, Mark, right. that we deal with in terms of this constant flow. Nature never intended water to go east and west right. to the St. Lucie River and on and west to the Caloosahatchee, but canals were dug long, long time yes. ago yep. as part of flood control. And it speaks to that larger issue of trying to work with this. So as we look on next year, what are we looking at in terms of water flows? And as we begin to expand out to more of a mid-vision what are we looking at in terms of operating schedules, whether we're going to be looking at these flows, whether they're going to be restrained? What are your concerns going forward and your hopes? Well, in the kind of the midterm, the Climate Prediction Center is looking at maybe even a below average of uh, normal dry conditions. So we probably don't expect it to be wetter than it has been before. But what's going to happen is we're going to still have to recover uh, these systems from from all of this inundation of, of rainfall this the, at this time of year. So, but going forward, we're also looking and optimistic about the new schedule for Lake Okeechobee. As you know, we've been wrestling with a schedule that was developed in 2008. Mm -hmm. You know, over you know 14 years ago. So, yeah. what we need to do now is this new schedule, which will come into place next spring in March or so. We're going to try to get that that schedule to not release to the estuaries, both to the East Coast and the West Coast, so there's no harmful discharges. Is it likely you're gonna to get to zero discharges then? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the plan. And, and you have congressional yeah. backing there oh, as yeah. well. Oh yes, yes. I know that you've had fierce advocacy by our local Congress yep. people as well. Brian Mast has talked a lot about this. Do you really think you can get to zero discharges then? Oh, All yeah. you need is one big summer yeah. storm for them to say we've got to override that. Well, you know, when the if if we were at that schedule right now, they would not have. They would still be at that zero discharge management level. As we look on when at it, the big lake. When it gets big, though, when it gets really high, way over 16 and a half, 17 feet. If it ever got up to that level, even with the new schedule, it would require that they do some releases for the safety of people that live around a lake. We can't, um, right. you know, we, provide that. Exactly. There's always been the concern about the levee. It's been reinforced greatly, the Herbert Hoover Dyke, over the last decade plus. Right. Right. But nonetheless, uh, though it's had a, a makeover, a big and needed one, there always is that concern. And you're always balancing that. Safety of people living yeah. by the lake, water supply, yeah 
enough water to move south from the lake. Agriculture interests have concerns about enough right. water coming south uh, for them. Concerns about how much can go east or west. It's this right. ballet it, and it everything to get in sync is a very yeah. difficult thing. It is, and, and with the engineered system we had, we're, it's very difficult to manage. So of course we're trying to get the long-term systems in, which would really balance that out and hopefully res restore that comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, putting in the new EA reservoir and storage treatment facilities south of the lake in order to get that water to be able to have the capacity to move it south and get into the, uh, the Everglades where it's supposed to flow. You're a mind reader. I right. want to get to the long-term vision in a moment yep. uh, because it's all this system that begins up in the watershed, Shed. the right. Kissimmee River, water flowing yep. south, nature intended it to flow into the lake, then flow south in a broad sheet of water. Flood control changed that, flood control canals to the south. We've talked about all the water coming yep. east and west. You're trying to recreate in part what nature's done in the upper reaches above the lake, then into the lake, then south. Right now, the headlines I'm picking up thus far are that you are confident, and you haven't always been, we've talked about this a lot over the years, you're confident you're gonna get an operating schedule that generally speaking will mean a lot less in terms of outflows from the lake, except right. in the most extreme, extreme circumstances. circumstances. Is that fair? That's fair, And that's yes. big. Yeah, that is big. And it's been being worked on over the last three years or so. So we're, but, but the core and the district are right there and saying, this is the schedule, we're ready to go for it, and uh, we're very hopeful that that'll happen this next spring. Another headline, you and I were out there to see yep. it, uh, as were many other uh, yeah. dozens of people you know well, the C44 projects like that, that when water does come east, huge filtration so that the water that does come east into the river estuary and lagoons cleaner. Uh, maybe that system wasn't pressed as hard as it will be in the future, but do you have confidence it's working and can stand up to the challenge of when water comes east, that it will filtrate it in a way that'll have a significant ongoing impact? Exactly. This is this, just this year that, that, yeah. that project was C44. Yeah. The C44 project is part of the comprehensive Everglades plan. It will take up that water in that basin before it gets discharged directly to the estuary. So we're really, we're glad that that's up and operational yeah. and as a uh, part Impressive of the Impressive project. I've been out yeah. there several times. Talk yeah. about the longer term vision, mm -hmm. your hopes and concerns. We talk about now a reservoir south of the lake. There was a big fight this year about how much water will go south. Ag interest wanting to make sure they have their allotment. That's a big yeah. part of the yeah. discussion yeah. and debate, trying to create these balances. What are we looking for in terms of timelines of that reservoir being finished so that water can be mm -hmm. kept there and move south into Everglades National Park and beyond as need be, which is timely because it celebrates its 75th anniversary and everything that happens here affects the national park to ourselves. National park to the south, exactly. Uh, we're and Florida Bay, I might Florida add. Bay, all the way south, correct. That whole system. So where so, are we there? Well, we're, we're at that, we're, we've already started that construction. It's already been authorized through Congress. The funding is, is coming down the line. We've seen that construction ongoing. And so the, the projected completion is 2028. And so we've got a few years yet to go to complete that project. Um, these big regional projects like this take a long time to appropriate, authorize, appropriate, and then finally get constructed. But you feel good. I, I feel pretty confident that that project will get done and we'll have that extra capacity. But, but I don't think we're done yet. Okay. We still have a long ways to go to be able to really complete the whole system to be able to hold and store and move that water south instead of having these damaging districts. And what more do we need to do for that? Well, it may take some extra, extra parts of the plan to be able to increase our capacities down that south system. And we can either do that operationally, or we can do that through more regional projects, or at the source of the issue, which may be upstream, all the way up to the headwaters of the Kissimmee and up in the Kissimmee Valley. Once again, you gave an answer before the question yeah. came. You can tell how expert Mark is at this, and that's a great point. We have to look north of the lake yep. in terms of inflows in, also right. a lot of ranching and agricultural interest there, inflows and phosphorus runoff and the like. Where are we there in terms yeah. of what comes into the lake to begin with and moves east and west as well, as we have a lot of ranching and ag interests that uh, right. are, are all part and parcel of this? Yeah, that two and a half million acres north of the lake is, is a big part of the watershed. And trying to do something up there, there have been some projects proposed. We're not confident that they are going to do what it needs to be done. So you really need to work upstream in all of those components of the watershed in order to stop the flows and the pollution from coming in and making it down. As you know, the Kissimmee River Valley, Kissimmee River was restored part in the lower portion. So that has really helped 
to expand that, uh, you know, that, that, that big flowway in, in there at that part of that lower Kissimmee. Mark, if, at the end of the day, it's such a complicated topic, yeah. and thank you for breaking it down. We've talked about it a lot over the years. At the end of the day, as we come to the end of 22, look ahead to 2023 and beyond, your headline and bottom line for our viewers. Well, our headline is that there, there are these things that are going to come online this next year. There is there are good hope for the future and the projects coming up. But we have to stay diligent and we have to be persistent in, in keeping going with the plan. We've got great momentum. We've completed some of the projects. We've got great momentum in funding and authorization. We need that to keep going both at the federal and the state level. So we need everybody on board to kind of keep moving this thing forward now that we have this momentum build up. We can't give up. We can't, we can't let, let our foot off the gas, if you will. We have to we keep our pedal to the metal there and keep it going forward. All right, well, I, I've known you a long time. Yeah. Taking foot off the gas is not something you'll be doing. We appreciate your time helping give our viewers uh, such an important look at something that has such broad environmental and therefore economic impacts on our region. We thank you for your time. Aaron, glad to do it. Still ahead, Antonio Fence, political editor from the Palm Beach Post, joins me on the roundtable.